The next speaker is uh, Mr. Misha Toller. He is with Ericsson. He is a chief architect at Ericsson, and he will talk about self-synthesizing networks, sophisticated metaverses. And the question is, will we trigger an AI singularity in the era of 6G? So, Misha, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, with us uh, in our conferences. And uh, I would like to give your stage to you and please deliver your speech. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And a massive shout out to our DJ, Akos Balogi. This was the coolest uh, in between sessions I've ever had in conference. It's such a cool idea to have a DJ. Uh, also, you know, happy International Women's Day. So, congratulations on that very important day. And uh, let's get going on my keynote today. I'm calling in from Silicon Valley. I have moved to the United States. I'm currently a chief architect in Ericsson Inc. here in the Valley. And um, I thought, you know, you guys are really into AI and there are a lot of interesting problems currently, uh, you know, keeping us up at night. And uh, some of them are great opportunities. Others are real challenges. And I thought I'll just throw it out to you and see how it goes, right? So I hope we're going to have some good Q&A, some good discussions thereafter. Now, you, you, you can read the title here. It's, uh, it's full of very dense keywords, uh, and I'm not sure you have heard about all of them before. So what I thought of doing is, is I focus first on 6G, really give you a little vision on what we as a company and we as a community uh, think uh, 6G really will be, uh, will be looking like in the, in the next future. We then talk about self-synthesizing networks. I explained you exactly what that is. And last but not least, we move on to the metaverses and then see how we put it all together. And where I'm going to pose you the question actually to you, is that now the age of singularity? And I hope you understand that kind of uh, you know, uh, flow of thought until we arrive at the end of that presentation. So let's get going. Let's start really with 6G. And... Um, if you look at the top row, you know, you see essentially what we think 6G may look like. What may it do actually within the next, you know, eight, 10 years? What, what are we really driving at? So before we start building boxes and doing architectures and, and coding codes, you know, we thought let's really ask the question, what will it be for? Now, I have to say that as a telco community, you know, we are not always very good in doing this. So, you remember, we started designing 4G uh, before the iPhone came along, right? So, we decided to start designing 5G before all the augmented reality, virtual reality glasses came along. So, you know, we're, we're, always, um, we're always, you know, the applications are always like 10 years later emerging, but they do emerge. So, we know that 6G will be of use you know, no matter what we do with that. So the four, four use cases, uh, big groups of use cases are really easy to understand. The first one is all about us humans, okay? It's really about you and me, about our family, about our children, about our grandparents. Uh, it is really the ability to build these fully immersive environments through what we call the Internet of Senses, right? So we would have uh, holographic projections, volumetric, volumetric capturing, augmented reality glasses, maybe even contact lenses. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about a Silicon Valley company which is doing AR contact lenses. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening, but the ultimate goal is to make sure we make this really human-centric. At the same time, we realized that, you know, the uh, connectivity ecosystem is really good for the emerging Internet of Things, so about machines, connecting machines, manufacturing, all, et cetera. And we really want to bring this further to the foreground and make sure we improve that even further. The the third one is about our world, okay? And that's a really interesting uh, kind of vision here, the red box about digitized and programmable physical worlds. It's really that notion that you're building a digital twin about the entire world, right? So you, the idea is that we'd be able to uh, really build a digital representation of whatever world we're in. It might be my office as an example. And then we can run different scenarios and have the networks reconfigure these physical networks. And that's really important. That's a big difference to this Internet of Senses. This is not only about sensing things. This is also about actively reconfiguring them. Uh, 
And the theme across all three is really the ability to make that sustainably. Okay, so we need to really help with the sustainability of the green box. And we have loads of ideas in how we could do it. And again, these are four boxes here. I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty still. But it's really about doing limitless connectivity, uh, bringing in intelligence into the networks. So and we'll talk about this intelligence in a moment. Uh, really working on this network compute fabric and make sure it's really trusted. And I'll really come to this on my last slide where I'll talk about the singularity that trust worthiness is so important, right? So these are the scenarios we see emerge. Now, what about the tech capabilities, right? So what will 6G really look like? And uh, again, uh, quite a lot of uncertainty. What we do know is what 5G is able to deliver. We also know what 4G is able to deliver and 3G. And when you do that pipeline of 3G, 4G, 5G, you see a very constant multiplier. As an example, the data rates as we went from 3G to 4G and then 4G to 5G were always multiplied by 10, okay? The, uh, uh, the, uh, the number of devices was div uh, multiplied by, by 100, right? Um, so the density increased essentially by a factor of 10. We also had the um, energy efficiency going down, uh, sorry, going up, the energy consumption going down, the uh, latency going down, and it's always by the same multiplier. Now, using this law of uh, multiplication of this uh, predictive law, we are able to glance into the crystal ball and say, this is what 6G will look like, right? So we know that the, the data rates will be in the hundreds of gigabits per second, maybe even a terabit per second uh, at peak, right? We also know the latency will be extremely low, so even lower than what we have today. Uh, but most importantly, when you start multiplying all these uh, factors, you get the mobile data volume. And that's a very important number because it tells you really how much data is being generated and absorbed in a certain area, right? So in, in 4, 5G, we have 10 terabits per second per square kilometer. Can we believe that? Yeah, we can. I think, you know, we could think of a square kilometer maybe, you know, in the uh, in the downtown in Budapest or in London or New York, uh, Silicon Valley, unlikely it's fairly, uh, you know, suburban area, but maybe San Francisco, Los Angeles. So you can think of these type of data densities. Uh, what about 6G? So if we do the multiplication, you get 10 petabytes per second per square kilometers, right? So I run loads of scenarios. There's no scenario out there which would somehow justify these type of data rates, at least from today's perspective. So my hunch is really, and that's a personal prediction, is that in 10 years' time, really, the majority of the traffic will not originate from phones or laptops or any of the very generic and traditional devices. So there will be a totally new ecosystem of devices, a totally new ecosystem of services, and we need to move away from that very discrete way of providing video services service, voice service, et cetera, right? So it will be what I call a continuous spectrum of services, which may appear and disappear in milliseconds uh, or may stay there for years. And uh, uh, the majority of these services may actually be procured by AI. So it's not a more a human, it's not a more Misha there sitting and doing, you know, the programming of uh, these type of services. It will be AI spinning up and, and killing down the these type of services, right? So that's uh, on our view in terms of the tech capabilities. So we talked about what's our societal vision, application vision, what is our tech vision, and let's talk about the timelines, right? So the timelines are quite important to us industry and really trying to understand when, when will 6G really be commercial. So let's look at it at the very end of this slide. So on the right-hand side on the bottom there. So it will be 6G will be, uh, you know, fully commercial by 2030. This is about, you know, eight to 10 years from now. Okay, that's a long time. And uh, no matter how hard we try, we always seem to stick to these 10 years. And the reason is because it is really difficult to do. It takes time to do research, this basic research, which we have started as early as 2017, 18. Then we need to align with the industry. Then we need to start the formal process in ITU. And the ITU is basically the International Telecom Union, which tells us what type of system parameters do we 
need to achieve? Uh, what type of capabilities do we need to achieve to make that system 6G compliant? And then we start standardizing. Okay, and standardization is a very, very long thing mainly because humans are involved. So these are meetings of hundreds of people trying to agree on the very same standard, right? So if you think uh, the uh, the time it takes maybe just between uh, two or three colleagues of years to agree on something, now multiply this by 100 and uh, put in a commercial you know, ambition in there and you understand why it takes so long. But the big question is, can we do it quicker, right? Can we do that quick? And I'll come to that in a moment. But you see that a lot of stuff is really ring, uh, uh, rumping up in Europe. We have HexAX, uh, China, Japan, Korea started initiatives. Uh, here in the US, a really interesting project uh, launched by the NSF, it's a Rings. Uh, this is essentially $40 million to look into uh, you know, timely 6G uh, and related uh, uh, research project. And then we have the next G alliance here also in the United States. Uh, and then in the global, we have the NGMN, uh, which we can't to contribute to, uh, as well as other initiatives. So we will have most likely the first requirements about 6G by the end of 2023. And uh, most likely, don't quote me on this, but we expect the very first draft 3GPP uh, um, standard you know, to, be, to come out towards the end of 2024, beginning of 2025. But uh, a lot of uncertainty, but this is how we are thinking at the moment. Okay, so this is what's about 6G and uh, where we are in terms of timelines. Now, let's move on to um, the self-synthesizing networks. One thing we're trying to understand is, is really uh, how can we shorten this innovation cycle, these 10 years, right? So it seems to be a fairly hard constant in our you know, in our telecom ecosystem, it's a bit like the speed of light in physics. Uh, it seems to be our cycles we take to go from generation to generation. And um, there is, of course, a financial element there as well. So don't get me wrong. This is not only technology. But the question we are trying to answer is, you know, or I tried to answer at least, you know, before joining Ericsson, can we shorten that? And now within Ericsson, I'm trying to figure out how to make that really happen. How can we make these uh, innovation cycles a little bit quicker? So there's um, <clears throat> the whole movement around open, right? So open run, and we are driving a lot of these uh, standards, uh, you know, initiative in all run. We are contributing to the security specs to make sure that works really well. So there's a lot of stuff we're doing. But the really the enabler is AI. Right, so and AI has been in telecoms for quite a long time, and we have been using it initially to <coughs> to do the early configuration of the networks. Right, so it turns out as we move from three G, uh, sorry, from two G to three G, we realize wow, there's a lot of new stuff we need to configure in the network, uh, and it's hugely dynamic. And as we went from three G to four G, you know that degree of freedom in the network was even multiplied by hundreds. So we got uh, millions of parameters in a country to optimize to make sure that the network runs well. Now, no human can do that, which is why AI was so handy. And where you know initially we talked about um, we talked about you know SON self organizing networking, and the telco community was actually one of the first one to really start using AI uh, in these type of production ready systems, right? So the whole notion of using reinforcement learning, we have done that 15 years ago, okay? When I was in France Telecom, uh, we used uh, reinforcement learning to actually uh, configure the antenna tilt and make sure there's no conflict between the cells. Um, then later on, we started to introduce, uh, you know, deep learning reinforcement learning. That was done at CTTC. A few years later, Google DeepMind threw that out, and they were quoted as the inventor of deep uh, learning, um, of uh, deep learning uh, reinforcement learning. But actually, we in the telco ecosystem have done this much earlier. Just look up the literature, you will find that uh, Lorenza Giuponi and uh, my colleague at CTTC, who is now with me in Ericsson as well, you know, she has really started that. And then uh, transfer learning. I started that in 2000, uh, when was that? <clears throat> uh, 2008, maybe? Uh, 2007, 2008, uh, transfer learning really where I looked at the Q learning tables and I realized that you can improve convergence of the AI algorithms when you start transferring some of the Q entries 
into similar situations. So that whole notion of transferring, we didn't call it transferring, I called it docetive radio, uh, the teaching radio, uh, but essentially we in telecoms have been using these fantastic AI assets much, much earlier. So what are we driving now? We are driving now what I call these self-synthesizing networks. So this is all about self-learning. So, so far we have used, uh, you know, AI to really improve the performance of the networks. The big question I'm asking is, can we use AI to design networks, right? So let's look into this. Why would we do this? So if you look at the pipeline in telecom, and look, this is a pipeline which works also in a lot of computer science projects, engineering projects, you name it, right? So you start with research. Let's look at the left column here. We start with research, then we do prototyping and design, then we go to standards, uh, then we start deploying, configuring it, and then we run the networks, okay? Or we run the product, whatever that is. Now, in telecoms, I just explained to you how we have been operating for the last 10 years. It's the middle column here, and we call this autonomous or self-organizing networks. Uh, lately, it's also been called zero-touch networks, meaning humans don't have to do anything because AI will do that. And in that pipeline I showed you, uh, the last two boxes are essentially augmented by AI. They're not entirely run by AI, but at least augmented by AI, which helps us humans to run these networks. And uh, the first three boxes, research, prototyping, and standardization, is still very human-driven. So what I started to look at is, is you know, to accelerate innovation, and apart from opening up parts of the networks, the interfaces, very important, uh, can we use AI to actually uh, design networks? Can AI design a new IP protocol? Can AI design a new, a new architecture, right? Uh, could AI help in standardization? Right? And you will say, hey, this is crazy, Misha, what are you talking about? But actually, if you look at current 3GPP uh, specifications, in the annex, we already have machine readable text of the very verbose, uh, you know, technical specifications which go over the first hundred pages. Really interesting there, the transformation and also the question, what's the role of standards in an ecosystem like that? That's probably, you know, the theme of another keynote. Uh, but right now, let's really focus on this self-synthesization. So it's very different to these um, uh, autonomous networks. Because autonomous networks, it's all about uh, really configuring in an automated way what humans have designed. Self-synthesizing is machines to design the networks, okay? And uh, research probably will still be very human-driven, but I can imagine a future where this becomes more and more AI-driven or AI-augmented. And you have seen, you know, the work which DeepMind has done in medicine, in the DNA profiling, uh, now starting also to di discover new physics laws, et cetera. So AI will be in research sooner than you think. But let's focus on self-synthesizing that. Works. Well, you know, I have worked on this at King's College for quite a while, and uh, I post that, you know, really as a the workflow to be like this, right? To, to achieve these self-synthesizing networking capabilities, we need to follow these very uh, basic four principles, okay? So the first thing we would need to do is we cast a novel human uh, and or maybe in the future AI augmented invention into design templates. So think about it. You had a great research idea. Um, you research it maybe on paper, maybe you published that. It's being published on the ACM and the IEEE libraries. And um, the moment it's published, let's say, you know, by midnight, uh, 8th of March 2022, that is being automatically downloaded and cast into some uh, design innovation templates. At the beginning, presumably, humans need to do it in the future. That could probably be automated. Then you use some <laughs> what I call uh, meta natural language processing. And that's something uh, you know, I introduced in 2018, where I really talked about this uh, a requirement to make a lot of the uh, you know, kind of verbose texting into machine readable format. And then from this machine readable to translate it into other type of uh, machine readable formats, right? So this meta NLP, I think, is a really interesting uh, area. So we, we then translate this into these different uh, uh, languages and models, whatever you want to do. The next thing we need to do is to really make sure this runs into uh, no problem. 
uh, we won't run into problems as we uh, deploy it uh, globally. We need to verify it whether the code or whatever that is, these models are consistent. And there's a language called the B language, which is traditionally being used to do that uh, form of verification. So once that is done, you translate all that into your operational software, embedded software, you know, ASIC code, whatever, FPGA code, using, you know, get into C, C++, Python, you name it, right? So that's the, uh, the, the plan of attack. And we have been working on this actually, you know, in Kings with my students when I was still there. So we, we did this with Python, right? So we trained essentially in 2018 uh, a, a, an AI to write computer code, which would help us with this type of pipeline. Okay, so we have a whole list of documentation there. In the meantime, last week or two weeks ago, you will have heard, uh, you know, Alpha Code's announcement from DeepMind that they are now, and I have a video here which you can't hear the sound, so I'll just play it and I will talk over that, right? So uh, you just Google that and you will find essentially that video and you find so much more material about this. And I would presume a lot of you know about that already. But Alpha Code is AI to write code. And um, this is exactly what we've done up here in, uh, in our self-coding research. Uh, the, uh, the, they have done it now really at production level and uh, entered competitions. And uh, it turned out that now their code is within the fifth to 60 percent uh, quantile in terms of uh, world's top coders, right? So this is not like a person like me who's coding. Uh, this is like the best coders and, uh, uh, you know, alpha code is now within the 50, 60 percent of that league. So, you know, it won't take a long time until alpha code will be, you know, on top of that list. They have always been able to go up that ranking. You remember when the competition's about uh, image recognition uh, came out, ResNet 50, ResNet, et cetera, and then all these other models came up. So at the end of the day, uh, probably AI will beat us in that coding. So therefore, they will take up, you know, really a, a, an important step, uh, you know, in that pipeline here. So we're there, okay? So we're there. This is not a thing of the far future when it comes to self-writing uh, uh, code, okay? So let me... Um, stop that video here, let's see, and go to the next slide. And let's move on to the metaverse, okay? So we do have uh, the Facebook or Meta's advertised approach. So the metaverse, for those who don't know, um, is essentially just a virtual environment where humans can essentially interact, right? So this is different from the traditional or for the normal games. Of course, they are games and, um, you know, which do this, but normally in the game is just you against the machine, uh, et cetera. But uh, here really the metaverse is you're in a digital world and you can interact with another human. You can talk to them, you can do things, you can live a digital life there and you can transact, which is also why the NFT community, non-fungible token community woke up. But that's really, you know, again, maybe the topic of another keynote altogether. And, uh, you know, whether you like Facebook or not, uh, I think uh, what they have done, what Meta has done is very important. They've galvanized the entire community to look at this more seriously. So when a company like Meta throws $10 billion at this problem, that means, you know, they're very, very serious about this. Big question is, you know, do we agree with the virtual reality thing? Do we want to want to have this like, I don't know, in the film's Inception or the film like uh, Matrix, right? So do we want to be in a completely isolated, uh, you know, environment and just operate in the digital world? I leave that to you, right? Um, I probably personally prefer the augmented reality version of that. So you would have spatial anchoring. My AR glasses would understand what's happening and build my interactive digital uh, metaverse around me with that. Um, but here you go, right? And we do have metaverses already today. So anybody who is playing Fortnite, night, uh, you know, you could argue that is one, or if you're playing um, uh, other games, you know, that <clears throat> um, such as Minecraft, etc., you know, these are metaverses in doing today. Of course, the, the uh, consumption of the content is still on a 2D screen, 
but we see that future coming now with the augmented and virtual reality headset. So this is about the metaverse itself. Now, um, to make that metaverse happen, it's actually not that simple because you need to translate this world really into this virtual world. You need to build physics, you need to build ray tracing, you need to build a social fabric, which somehow mimics what's going on in our world, right? Um, and the other version of the metaverse is maybe this more holographic society, as we call that, right? So the ability to really <clears throat> uh, to do volumetric capturing of whatever, whomever you want to interact with, and then do a holographic projection of that person. So you see the guy having a, a meeting with a holographic girl, and she would have the holographic projection of the guy, right? So is that a better way to think? think about the metaverse? Is that a better way to think about how society should develop? I'll leave that again to you. So uh, it's really up to you how you do it. Uh, uh, fact is, you know, we are starting to build these digital replicas of the physical world, and that allows us to do so much more than what we have been doing before. And with that, I'm coming to my uh, slide here, how we think in Ericsson about this, right? So it's uh, well before Meta announced their Metaverse. In Ericsson, we have been thinking, how would a 6G future look like? And uh, this is really that cyber-physical continuum. So you have a physical world which has sensors embedded. It's sensing, right? So it's sensing my room, it's sensing my environment, and it translates that into a digital world. In that digital world, we can run scenarios. We can uh, you know, do traceback and analyze it in the past, or we can simulate and predict things for the future. And once we agree on a certain thing and we like a certain configuration, we can program that physical world because we not only have sensors who sense, but we also have actuators who act, who reprogram this well, right? Um, an example might be, you know, the, the I'm sensing that I'm in this room now, I'm sitting in an uncomfortable position here, then the in the digital world, in this metaverse, we would run simulations very advanced with physics and maybe medical programs, and they figure out, you know, Misha, you're sitting very badly, so it would then reprogram the table, who would then maybe just zoom up, the chair would go down, uh, you know, the light would maybe change colors, it would adapt in real time to, to me and my needs here, right? So that's how we think about it. And 6G will be very important there because it not only helps with the data transfer forth and back on sensing actuation, but it also uh, helps with the sensing. So those people work in 6G will know that in the future we will move to frequency bands which are in the terahertz range. Terahertz has a great resolution, so it's like a radar. The moment you communicate a bit in byte in 6G, you can also use it as a radar and understand how your environment looks like. So this joint sensing and communication will be a big thing in 6G. Okay, so how do we put this now all together? And that's my last slide, right? So, and why do I talk about singularity and what are we doing, uh, you know, within Ericsson, within our community to overcome that? So if we look at how AI and, you know, AI frameworks in general, you can think of any family, whether these are your uh, CNNs, you know, your, um, your LSTMs, the RNNs, uh, your GANs, one-shot learning, uh, you know, deep, uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning, whatever that is, right? So normally uh, humans would design these digital services, for instance, you know, a digital twin or a, uh, you know, a certain software. We would use AI to optimize that, did parameters, run scenarios until we get the optimum parameter, uh, and then the digital service would run much better. Now, our AI framework relies on an infrastructure. You need AI requires storage, requires networking, and requires compute, right? So you all know that, you all have been using that. And uh, the interesting thing is in the last years, we have seen really a push into entirely new paradigms when it comes to infrastructure. And I call them the infrastructure accelerators. Okay, so on the storage side, we're talking neuromorphic storage, where actually storage and compute is very close together. So you're saving a lot of energy um, and uh, actually space on the on the die to really make that happen. So storage is a big in ingredient. The future will change the capability of AI. We talked about 6G, new fibers coming out, right? So we talked about this. On the compute side, we will have Quantum. 
So imagine quantum, you know, one of the biggest problems we have in our backpropagation optimization with CNNs, you will know that very quickly, or even with LSTMs, you know, we are, we are running into convergence problems very quickly. And that, that, that is really a compute problem. Okay, quantum can handle NP complete problems in a linear fashion. So therefore we have entirely new compute paradigms at hand in the future to make this happen. Neuromorphic is also very interesting because AI, if configured properly in neuromorphic uh, infrastructures requires zero energy, okay? Uh, because it's part of the neuromorphic fabric, how that works. So we have all these accelerators and they will make AI better and better, exponentially better. Okay, and that will help us with our, our services. But here's the bummer, okay, and that I call this loop one, by the way. So this is a, this is a good loop. We're on, we're on top of that. We like this loop. Here's an emerging loop, okay? I call this loop two. Let me just bring this up, right? So, and that is now where we start building that metaverse. Remember, the metaverse is a digital representation of the world. You can make it, you know, entirely decoupled from reality, but you could also make this literally Earth to zero if you wanted to with real physics, you know, real chemistry, real biology, whatever you want to do. Now, on our infrastructure accelerators, these AI algorithms can run, you know, different scenario in this metaverse much quicker and much more energy efficient than what we have been doing before. Okay, so therefore, you could imagine that AI starts to learn within this metaverse things which it has not been able to learn before. And the reason is also because we as a human species have learned through haptic engagement, through touch, through hugging, through doing, through hunting, right? So moving, driving. So that um, movement, haptic body element is very important for our uh, neurodevelopment. And actually quite a few people, including Jan, have said that, you know, we are a bit in a plateau of AI because we haven't cracked that next step in terms of how AI really learns. But with the metaverse, it becomes a possibility. There's real physics in this virtual world. There's real chemistry, real biology in that virtual world. And we do have the infrastructure accelerator. So suddenly AI can start learning at a speed that is much quicker and how we can teach it. Okay, so AI learns quicker than humans can teach it. That, by all means, is a definition of a singularity. And things become even more difficult if we go into this programmable world because then AI uh, can reprogram this world, okay, to hopefully our liking, but it may also start doing it to its own liking, all right? So this is kind of a nightmare AI singularity scenario, which is why it is so important to today to really focus on that trustworthiness, you know, on that explainable AI. That whole world of explainable AI had been pioneered in King's College London by my colleagues back then and has now become a really big topic. And the reason it's become a big topic is because of that, okay? Because we really need to make sure that as we understand what AI is doing, we want to make sure that we don't get it to the point where we just can't control it anymore. Uh, we don't want all these nightmare scenarios you see in various science fiction, uh, who, if we don't pay uh, attention, may actually not be science fictions anymore uh, very soon. So I'm very helpful. I'm very excited. There are a lot of ingredients, compute ingredients, capability ingredients emerging over the last you know months, literally, or days, <clears throat> which lead us into a future which is uh, potentially very exciting, but we really need to make sure that we uh, keep this under well control, therefore trusted AI is really a big topic. Okay, I'll leave you with that, and um, I'm happy to take comments and questions and look forward to our dialogue now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it, and thank you everyone for listening in to Michelle's presentation. So, uh, as always, after the presentation, we have the question and answer session, and also you have the opportunity to rate the presentation in the polls area. So, let me just dig in here. What do we have as questions today? So, let's start with Jeffrey's question. As we move away from mobile phones or laptops, do you have a, a hypothesis of what those uh, services, devices will look like? Yeah, so we, we don't really know. We, we only know now that, you know, the, <clears throat> the world of 
<clears throat> XR and VR is really taken off, right? So the next 12 months, from my view here in Silicon Valley, I can uh, confirm that you know a lot of stuff currently has been announced publicly by the uh, OM uh, vendors here, and uh, that could be the very first baby step. Mm -hmm. And uh, that though means we will be wearing you know either goggles who completely block our view or glasses, which may not be that convenient. Um, um, there's another company here, which I, is also in Silicon Valley, uh, Mojo, uh, Vision Mojo, I think it's called, which are designing contact lenses, uh, which would be essentially, you know, uh, wirelessly connected to do exactly that AI experience. Will that be better or not? I don't know. So we need to see. I think, you know, my hypothesis is there might be some biological stuff coming towards the end of this uh, decade, which then requires really a device density and a data rate density, which is essentially needed to support the 10 petabytes per second per square kilometer. So we'll see. The next step is really, um, VR, AR, right? The the one after maybe contact lenses and then other type of biological stuff, which which still needs to be designed. Good so question, are, though. Thank you. Yeah. So you are also mm. believing a little bit the augmented human, not only augmented reality, right? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I, I, I'm not sure you know, but I'm a big fan of this notion. I I started designing this Internet of Skills, you know, uh, years back, and the idea is really. To augment capabilities of humans, I believe in this human four zero. Not only industry four zero, but human four zero. Ah, yeah. I see. Thank you. Mm. Let's move on to the next mm. one. It's from Peter Silvashi. AI will eventually code better than humans. How do you? How could this technological singularity be handled? Would humans have a purpose in AI singularity? Journey to the evil movie, Wally movie. Sorry. <laughs> Peter, that's a good question. And that, I think, keeps us all up at night. And um, look, transformation, technology transformation has happened in humanity for, you know, for, for millennia. Okay, we all somehow got used to that. And uh, I, I personally think, you know, step by step, a lot of the stuff we have been doing as humans will be replaced by, um, by AI. Is, 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 is that a bad thing? Well, you know, with hindsight, if you look at uh, cars having replaced uh, horses or the electricity replaced candles, um, you know, or the emails replaced letters, it was always a good thing. OK, it was very painful to the community back then, but it's always a good thing. So now it's time to be painful, presumably to us. But uh, let me remind you the, the bigger picture, though. First of all, that transformation towards this general AI will still take a while. OK, will still take a while. So we have the ability to still, you know, kind of adapt in a sense. Um, the second thing I would like to remind you about is, is, you know, I think we as humans have something which machines probably will struggle for a very long time, I don't want to say forever. I learned in technology not to say forever, but a very long time. And they will struggle with create creativity, true creativity, not gun type creativity, where you teach a gun on prior human art. I'm talking about the emergence of a real Picasso, of a real Beethoven, right? So real creativity is something very human. Uh, emotion is something very, very human. And um, currently, you know, I don't know how your day looks like, but my day is very little uh, dedicated to my to creativity, right? So I'm spending a lot of time, uh, you know, doing PowerPoints, talking, designing, stuff like this. I'm wondering, you know, if AI could do part of that, you know, just even liberate 50% of my day, I'd be happy. I'd be very happy because then I can spend more time with my kids. I can spend more time uh, with my friends. I can be more creative. I can compose my next album for which I haven't had time for the last five years. So therefore, you know, I think it's not all doomsday. We just need to make to, uh, learn to manage that. And I think that AI singularity, which was brought up in 2003 by, by my colleagues in, in Oxford, is a real thing. So we just need to make sure we keep that trustworthiness in, in these AI families. Mm -hmm. Yes, I very much agree with you indeed. So I think AI is here to make our life uh, better, it may make our life simpler. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. we just bought recently a wash machine that do the dishes in the kitchen. Uh, we didn't have that <laughs> for, for a long time. And now we realize okay. that uh, robotizing <laughs> that has some benefits. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very good. Let's take the <clears throat> next uh, question. There are thought experiments that asks, are we already in the metaverse? So we create metaverse inside metaverse. Can you comment on the thought experiment? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's a great question. And um, let me start with the rigorous science here. So uh, that, that's really interesting. In 2017, a team of German scientists from Fraunhofer uh, published a paper in Science, I believe, so really peer-reviewed, calculating the, the energy needed to uh, simulate a world like ours. Okay, so basically what Elon Musk has been saying and other people, okay, that we actually live in a simulation today. They asked the question, how much energy is needed to really make this happen? And um, the answer is, is we are not so far away. So it is possible. In theory, there is enough energy in our, you know, kind of even in our, if we were to live in a metaverse, uh, there's enough energy to make that happen. And, um, and then people started to look at uh, glitches, right? So are there things we don't understand which don't make sense? And uh, one of them, interestingly, is really at quantum level. So nobody has ever been able to, to observe a non-discrete type of, uh, you know, uh, you know, rotation of an electron around an atom. Uh, even the Pauli levels in the quantum world, um, you know, these Heisenberg, level, I'm not sure you're a physicist, but they're called Pauli energy levels, right? Mm -hmm. they, are, they are discrete, okay? Discrete. They are not continuous, as you would expect from the whole nature. They're discrete. They are discrete the same way as our computer infrastructure is actually built, okay? So people started to look at it and say, hey, you know, there's a lot of stuff here, uh, little glitches, uh, which look a little bit like uh, programming glitches, which if you write software, you know exactly how that is, right? So, and why would one glitch in one domain be repeated in another? So a society has been formed here in California, which is kind of a top secret one. Uh, I don't even know how to get to this. And uh, as you can see, I know a lot about this because I'm actually interested the topic. So a society has been formed on this where the top mathematicians and physicists and engineers uh, are working together to figure out if we do live in a simulation, what is, uh, how can we essentially break out of this and start uh, building our own physics, right? So a bit like the matrix, okay? So it's literally like the matrix, actually, if I think about it. Um, so therefore, I think the question is really valid. And we don't know, of course, we, we lack this baseline observation. Okay, and as we get more and more knowledge about how the world works, we get uh, more and more confidence how, how things are. And, uh, you know, the chances, uh, Elon Musk put it roughly as one to 50 million that we live in a real base world rather than just a simulation. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but, uh, you know, we, we are on it, and it's a valid question. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and it's... Uh... It's quite difficult sometimes to distinguish if this is a simulation and the other is the real or if this is the real and the other yeah. is a simulation, right? Yeah. Those living yeah. in the simulation, yeah. Yeah. it might be the reality. Uh, exactly. One yeah. more question. You mentioned at the end of your presentation at Industry 4.0 and then the Human 4.0, that's what you... Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I presume that in Industry 4.0 we have the digital twins, so probably in the Human 4.0 we have our neural twins or... How can we? Oh, that's a good idea. I've thought about this. That's a great. It's a great analogy. Yeah, I I only chose the term of human for zero because everybody in our industry knows industry for zero. So I thought it would be yeah. It's about this augmenting, about the exoskeletons, about the augmented reality. Uh, just have tech help you to uh, you know to interact better, become a better human, do things better, more efficiently, effectively. So yeah. So this kind of uh, uh, you know the digital twinning equivalent uh, is an interesting one, and maybe also feeds back to that simulation question we have had before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Misha, for being with us and uh, for the nice talk and the great questions and answer session. Uh, you know that you can stay with us in the chat and also in the networking session where you can basically meet up with other people, discuss. So I uh, encourage you and I encourage everyone to stay with us. Now we will have a little break and after the little break we will have a little bit power talk with uh, George Dilschitz. So Fantastic. thank you very thank much you. and see you in Cheers. a bit. Bye-bye.